Good evening and welcome to Southern Hills this evening. We do want to extend a special welcome to all of our guests and visitors tonight. I hope at some point today you've been able to pick up one of our bulletins. There's a lot of information about our sick and shut-in, uh, but just a couple of, of announcements we'd like to make before we begin. We do want to remember Sharon Welburn and Sherry Mangrum. Uh, Sharon Welburn will be meeting with, will, has met with an oncologist and will begin treatment soon. Also, Sherry Mangrum, one of our Sunshine School teachers, is in the hospital recovering from surgery. Also this afternoon, I was made aware of Larry Barnes. Many of us know the Barnes from, uh, they were uh, members here years ago, but Larry Barnes had surgery this morning uh, to remove some more of his toes. And I know he would like to be remembered in our prayers as he recovers from, from that surgery. We also continue to extend our sympathy to the Post and the Sowell family on the passing of Cecil Cecil Sowell. Then some upcoming events. We have Kite Day coming up on April the 10th. That will be right after Bible class with a fellowship meal, a potluck meal, and then some uh, Kite Day activities. More information in the bulletin about that. Then coming up April the 9th for our ladies will be Day with Deet Linda. Uh, this will be April the 9th from 9.30 to 11. I know that will be an interesting presentation, so I hope many of our ladies plan to be there for that. Then also Disaster Relief will be meeting the packed boxes at 10 a.m. on Tuesday if you're able to uh, go down and help them pack boxes. Then this coming up Friday, April the 1st, our KFC will be going uh, to uh, Franklin Lanes for a bowling activity. You can see Cody and Nikki love it for more information about that. And then as we prepare for our graduates reception on May the 22nd, if you have a high school or college graduate, if you would let us know and then also see the bulletin for information about how to get the details to us. Um, but those are the announcements that I have for this evening. If you would bow with me in prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, we are thankful for the day that you have blessed us with. We are thankful for all of the activities that we are involved in. Father, we pray that as we uh, go go out with go through with these activities, that all that we bring glory to your name. Father, we pray that you be with each one of us as we enter in this period of worship. In Jesus' name, Amen. <clears throat> Good evening. So good to see each and every one of you here this evening. Feel please stand as we sing. be seated.
after this song, we will have our scripture reading and prayer. <clears throat> reading and opening prayer. Scripture reading comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 13 through 17. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or, by, or epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Please bow as you go before our God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now thanking you for this glorious day that you've blessed us with. We thank you for a wonderful day that we can spend time in this awesome weather and worship you. Lord, we pray for Sharon Wellborn and Cherie Magnrum as they're recovering and are going through uh, treatment. We pray you be with all the other sick and shuddens, and we also pray that you be with the Post and Sowell families as they mourn the loss of Cecile Sowell. It is also at this time that we pray that we take something uh, from the lesson tonight, help Brother Garrett as he gives us a lesson, and help us worship you in spirit and in truth. It's your son's name we pray. Amen. For Brother Garrett's lesson, let's stand and sing Soldiers of Christ Arise. <clears throat>
please be seated. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to 2 Thessalonians. We are in the second chapter. Uh, we're getting right close to the end of it. We'll finish chapter 2 today in our study. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we'll start in verse 13. I, I think it's always important as, as you study through a book like this to kind of remember some of the things you've talked about. And so this is the slide I've shown you that basically breaks down in a very short way each of the three chapters that consists of 2 Thessalonians. Right, the first chapter is about hope despite persecution. So what we realize about the Thessalonians, we saw this in the first letter that Paul wrote to him, and we see it again in the second letter, that it is a church that is going through a fair amount of suffering. Uh, they are being heavily persecuted. And with all the discussion in, in both of these letters being about the day of the Lord and the second coming of Christ, what one might wonder is that, like, what will that day be like? Having two distinct groups, right? You have those who are trying their hardest to serve God. And then you have those who are persecuting the servants of God. And so what we have in that first letter is this idea that Jesus is going to come. And what he's going to do is he's going to comfort the faithful. But it's going to be a terrifying day for those who are opposed to the gospel. Those who reject the message of Jesus Christ, because God will show his vengeance towards them. And this is really terrifying chapter for those who are opposed to the call of Christ. When we move into chapter two, we talked, I guess it was a couple weeks ago now, about when is the day of the Lord going to come? And it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing that's talked about, but chapter two is really confusing in a lot of ways, because what he talks about is that some people are claiming that, that Jesus already came. And we have kind of a hard time wrapping our minds around how anyone could possibly believe that. But, but that's what they believed. And, and what this chapter is about in chapter 2 is that Paul is describing them. No, Jesus hasn't come and he won't come yet until who he calls the man of lawlessness comes. Right? And, and, and it's, it's this kind of confusing section, and, and I gave you my take on it a couple weeks ago. But what we're going to talk about today as we get to the end of, of chapter two is more about that type of discussion before we move into chapter three, where he'll give a challenge to those who are being lazy or idle. But let's go ahead and talk about chapter two, starting in verse 13. Paul says, we ought to always give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved. I like the way that passage starts because Paul feels an obligation to give thanksgiving to God. Right? That when he thanks of the Thessalonians, he feels obligated, an oughtness, right? That, that he ought to give thanks to God for them, that he must do that, that he has to praise God and thank God for the Thessalonians and his work among the Thessalonians. You say, well, what is he so thankful for? Well, he's thankful because God chose them as the first fruits to be saved. Now, there's a little issue with this word first fruits here. And I thought about just, just passing it over and not even mentioning it. But I think probably among, I don't, I don't know what translations everybody using here, but... It's about 50-50 in, in the major translations of what this passage says, right? So this is the English Standard Version. It says, God chose you as first fruits to be saved. Some of your translations will say that God chose you from the beginning, right? And so like there's the difference. Is, is, is it that God chose them from the beginning or did God choose them to be the first fruits? And I'll tell you somewhat of what the issue is. It's, it's not a translation issue as much as it's like a manuscript type of issue. When they were writing down these manuscripts and copying the manuscripts, there's a real issue. And, and, and I'll just, I think you'll be able to understand what it is. The words look very similar is, is basically what it boils down to. So from the beginning is two words in Greek. It's, it's op arche. First fruit, take those same letters, put them together, op arche. Right? So it's like, it's the same letters, just one is two words and one is one word. You, you can imagine that like with handwriting on 
you know, a very ancient type of document, a little space between two words might sometimes not be big enough to figure out, is that one word or is it two words? And so that's kind of the issue. And that's why some of your translations say different things. If it says from the beginning, it's, it's not a, I mean, it's, it's very common type of teaching of Paul. As a matter of fact, in, in Ephesians chapter one and verse four, he'll say that, that, uh, God chose you to be holy and blameless from the foundation of the world. Like this idea that from the very beginning, you were God's chosen people. If, if it is supposed to be first fruits, then the idea probably reaches back into like the Old Testament. You think about these sacrifices and these offerings given to God and the acceptable offerings, the best offerings were the first fruits, right? They were, they were the first of the flock that was offered, the first of the fruit that was offered, uh, the, the, even, even the first of the children that, you know, it's always like it's the, the different types of offerings and, and sacrifices and, and, and things that we, in a sense, like um, consecrate to God. It, it, you give God of the first. And so the passage is either saying that God chose you from the foundation of the world or from the beginning, or he's saying God chose you to be like the very best type of offering. And I always say like, I, I think I'm smart enough to understand what the issue is. I don't know that I'm smart enough to like really have a dog in the fight with it, right? Like I don't really know what it, it technically is supposed to be. I think I understand what the issue is, but um, I, I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you, you have to believe it this way or the other. It, it, it's just a challenge to understand it. What I wanna talk about more though, is this idea of God's choosing. Because I think sometimes we get caught up with that. You start having this language about God like predetermining something or God choosing something or somebody being the elect of God. And, and what's happened in our world, and I think primarily because that teaching has been so misrepresented over the years, right? That, that the idea of, of biblical like predestination or, or God's elect or choosing, like it is a biblical concept. What is not a biblical concept is that God chose this person and this person and this person to be saved and everybody else to be lost and there's nothing they can do about it. You're either chosen or you're not. What you'll find very clearly throughout this passage is that these people have something to do with it. And what you'll find is that this idea of God's choosing is more about like this plan that he has. That, that God, before the foundation of the world, right? That God had predetermined the kind of the boundaries of salvation and, and what his plan of salvation would be and, and who would be the people of God and what they would do to be the people of God and the people who, as, as the language that he'll use here in a moment, hear the call of God and they obey it. Those people are the chosen, the elect, and the people who don't are not. And so when he thinks of the Thessalonians, they are people who, despite all the suffering they're going through, have held to the call of God. And, and Paul's like, I have to give thanks to God because you now are among the chosen. You're part of God's plan. You're part of God's purpose. You, you have, have attached yourself to God's eternal plan of, of salvation and in, in being with him. He says the first fruits to be saved, it's, it's all about salvation through sanctification by the spirit. And get this, Belief in the truth. So like we're talking about this idea of God's choosing. Well, who did God choose? Those who were sanctified by the Spirit and those who believe in the truth. Like it, there is something that, that the chosen do to be the chosen. It's, it's not out of their control. It's not something that, that they have no say in. They chose to believe. And, and so, like, because of their sanctification by the Spirit, because the Spirit set them apart 
and, and, and remove them from, from the sin and, and the, the things that stain the soul. Like the Spirit moved them based upon their belief in the truth. That's why they're the chosen. And he goes on, to this, he called you. God called you to be sanctified by the Spirit. He called you to obey the truth. You say, how did he call? Through the gospel. That's the calling. It's like God has this message of Jesus, this message that can sanctify you, this message that can save you, and, and you, you need to believe that. He's called, and, and what he's done is he's actually sent out, and we'll see this in a moment, apostles and, and people to go out and proclaim the message of God. And so he called you through the gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. This idea of the glory of Christ is interesting because throughout the Bible, it'll be phrased like this, but, but sometimes in somewhat different ways. And in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 21, it, there's this passage about like, like um, this hope we have is that, that it will put off or, or that our bodies will be transformed to take on like his glorious body. And it's this beautiful picture of the end of time where like we take on, the, in a sense, like the glory of Christ. And, and God wants that for each of us. He wants that for them. He called to them. He shared with them the gospel. And they accepted it. And so Paul says, like, I'm bound to thank God for you. Because when the gospel was preached to them, they listened to God. And they accepted the message of God. We obeyed the message of God. And so they get to obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so like, that's why he's thankful to God. Okay? And it's so like that part right there is like this, 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 this section where he's saying, okay, like, why am I bound to give thanks to God? Because this is what he's worked out. This is his plan, right? And, and you've accepted that plan. He's called and you've listened. Uh, you, he, is, he has chosen you because, because you received the gospel message. You believed the truth. And so he says this. So then, I'm thankful to God because of all this that he's done. So then, brothers, stand firm. And hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. So how did God call? Well, he used men like Paul to take his message and go share his message. And when Paul preached to them, like they were hearing not Paul's message, but was actually God's message. All right, back in this very first letter, he said, and one of the things that he's thankful for is that when they received the message of Paul, they, they welcomed it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God. All right, so God is like called to them through Paul and his preaching of the gospel. And what he tells them is, is because all of this is true and, and God has worked all this out, stand firm in it. The consistent teaching throughout Paul's letters to the Thessalonians, whether it's in 1 Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians, is that these people are being persecuted. These people are suffering. These people are hurting. And what, what is very natural, what is a very natural response is, is to kind of forsake what is causing the pain. I think, I've, I don't remember if I've done that. The, the way I've illustrated it before is that, like if you've ever burned yourself, the, the natural thing is that when, when, you're, when your finger hits a fire or your finger hits a stove or some, the very first response is to pull away. It's just natural when something hurts to pull away from it. And, and yet what these people are being told is don't pull away from it. 
You're living this Christian life and you are suffering because of it. But I don't want you to pull away. I want you to stand firm. It's a really hard thing to ask. It's a big thing to ask. But you have to remember, it's, it's all about obtaining the glory of the Lord, right? It's, it's all about the salvation that God offers. And so he says, stand firm and, and, and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us. The word tradition literally just means something that's like passed down, right? And it's like throughout the Bible, you'll read of traditions in a couple of different ways. There are traditions of men. We all have them, right? And it's, it's fine and good to have them. Like we have traditions and things we do uh, just because that's the way things have typically been done, right? How many songs do we sing in a service? I were never told that. That's just, that's just the way we do it, right? And there's nothing wrong with having, tra- it is wrong with binding traditions of men. It is wrong with taking the traditions of men and, and elevating them to the position of like, like God's word, but there's nothing wrong with having traditions. Uh, tradition just means it's something that's passed down. But, when Paul spoke, and this is really important to know, that, that what he's passing down is not a tradition of men. It's passed down from God. And so sometimes what happens is we read tradition and we automatically think traditions means like what people came up with. That's not like, biblically speaking, tradition can either be a tradition of men or it could be a tradition of God. Like it's just something passed down. And so what happened was Paul was taught by God and he passed that over to them. It is God's teaching that he's teaching them. And he's saying like, whether it's by the things I wrote to you, like 1 Thessalonians, or whether by the things that I've told you face to face, when I was with you, hold to them. Understand this is not tradition of men. This is God speaking that God inspired Paul and Paul is relaying this message. And so as we're reading the letters of Paul, of first and second Thessalonians, he writes to them, don't think these are things you could take or not take. This is God's message. This is God's teaching. And Paul's saying, hey, hold, stand firm and hold to them. And so he goes on and he says, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. And we'll stop right there. So God loved us. Because God loved us, he gave us eternal comfort and good hope. How can a people have eternal comfort and good hope through grace? Right? When we don't preach grace, it takes away two things. Comfort and hope. When we don't preach grace, then what you have is people who go through life without hope, without comfort. Because what happens is all of a sudden, we think that our salvation is determined by how good we are. And every one of us knows ourselves. Right? I, I know who I am. And, and I know this, that if my salvation is just strictly going to be determined by how good I am, there's no comfort in that. There's no hope in that. But when we understand the graciousness of God and, and what that entails, that God has offered something to, and like, it's, and, and, and hear me out, like we'll, this lesson doesn't end right at this moment. Like it's not determined by how good I am. 
God has offered me his grace as a gift. And I'm saved because of who God is, because of his graciousness. And so now what I have is I understand his love for me. And I realize that because he loves me, he wanted to offer me comfort. He wanted to offer me hope. Therefore, he offered me grace. Because that's the only way that I can have comfort and hope. But he goes on. Comfort your hearts and establish them, hear it, in every good work and word. Don't ever take the grace of God to say, well, then I don't do good work. No, you're missing the point, right? That, that our hearts are comforted because we know God is gracious and we find comfort then in, in, in doing good and, and, and knowing that that's what God wants and that's what pleases God and that's what glorifies God is our good word and our good works and, and our following him and our lives to him and our, and our obedience and our service to him. And so like we, we have hope because we recognize that our, our comfort and our hope is determined by his grace and that gives us the reason to establish like, our lives and our hearts and our comfort and all the good that we're doing, the good words and the good work that we're participating in. Um, and so it's funny, like when you're reading this, like it almost sounds like, if you just read, it almost sounds like Second Thessalonians is supposed to end right here. Like it, it seems like a very like, I don't know, like I read that, I'm like, this sounds like a, I don't know, like a farewell type of word, but it's not. Uh, we'll pick up in chapter three uh, next week. And cha- well, not next week, in two weeks. We'll pick up in chapter three and verse one in two weeks. Um, as for now, I, I think it's, I mean, God still loves you. God wants to offer you hope. God wants to offer you comfort. God offers you his grace. But like any good gift, you have to receive it. If we can help you receive the grace of God tonight, we would love to help you do that. If there's anyone in here who needs to be baptized, we would love to baptize you. If we can study with you further, we would certainly love to do that as well. If we can pray for you, if there's anything we could offer you tonight to help you in your walk with God, we want to give you this opportunity to sit on one of the front rows while we stand and sing this invitation song. I am resolved.
Now take this time for those that were unable to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning. Um, once I finish the prayer, if you need uh, the bread and the juice, if you would raise your hand and the gentleman in the back will come up and serve you. Open your Bibles to Psalm 22, and we're going to start reading in verse 11. It's so neat to see God's plan. The plan that he put in place, as Garrett talked about, the plan for salvation and how he had it all worked out ahead of time. And we see a little bit of that here in the prophetic writing inspired by the Holy Spirit, starting in verse 11. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me, strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open their mouths wide at me as a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like, like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me, a band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. They look, at, they, look they stare at me, they divide my garments among them, and my clothes they cast lots. We're going to stop there for now and think about what an amazing God that we have that he had the plan ahead of time and that we can have such great faith in him and that perfect sacrifice of Jesus. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, we love you. We're so thankful for you and and all the things that you've predetermined for us to be called yours. We're thankful for the sacrifice and how difficult And we acknowledge how difficult it was for your son to do that for us. Lord, I pray that as those partake of the bread right now, that we'll remember the agony and the hardship and the difficulty that Jesus went through thinking of us on the cross. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. And if you need to be served, please raise your hand. Will you pray with me again? (laughs) Lord, we are again so thankful for, as Garrett preached on, that wonderful grace. That grace that has been a part of your plan since the creation of the world. That grace that saves us, Lord. And uh, Christ's blood that cleanses us. We pray that we can live lives that are worthy of that sacrifice and that we can be with you in heaven for eternity. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we're determined there's a time to give back. There's multiple ways to give uh, electronically or physically here. If you are unable to uh, give, please raise your hand and, 
and the men will come forward. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, we're so blessed. And I pray that as we continue to sacrifice and give of our things that you've provided with us, that we see how much you bless us. I pray that as we make our plans and, and, uh, and we think about giving to you first with all that we have, and it's in your son's name we pray, amen. So glad that each and every one of you could come here to worship with us here at Southern Hills this beautiful evening. I want you to know that if you're visiting with us, you are our honored guest, and we do hope that you will stick around and so that we can get to know you a little bit better. We do hope you will all come back for our Wednesday evening Bible study at 7 p.m. and our Sunday morning service at 9 a.m. Our closing song will be He Gave Me a Song. If you will, please stand as we sing. sing the Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us, and we thank you for all the many blessings that you've given us today. We pray for all the sick and shut-ins, and we pray that we'll be able to get better and be back to worship with us again. We pray for all the men and women that fight for the freedom we have in this country that allows us to come, to get, come together and worship with you, worship with one another without fear of persecution. We thank you for the lesson that was brought to us today, and help us to put it into our everyday lives. We pray for the elders and the deacons of this church, and we pray that they lead us in a way that is pleasing in your sight. We pray for the leaders of the nation, and we hope that they make a good decision that is right in your eyes. We pray that we can one day make it to heaven with you, and thank you for the sacrifice of the Son of the Cross. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>